you've gone incognito. Welcome back, formless creatures that live in the back of my nightmares. It's time to review some more Invader Zim comics. If you haven't seen the first part, then I recommend going back and checking it out, because I am not going to explain my system again. So let's just jump right back into it. Last we left off on a bit of a lame note. Let's see if issue 12 will be any better. My empire of doom begins now! Weird to think that Invader Zim never had a proper time travel episode. It's one of the most universally used sci-fi concepts. Anyways, this is one of those bad future type stories. Apparently engaging your scary fast drive around the sun is enough to teleport you into the future. When exactly? It's unclear. Zim has actually successfully conquered the Earth in this future. How did he finally do it? Uh, it's also unclear. What we do know is that Miss Bitters has become some sort of robot spider abomination. That has nothing to do with the plot, but I literally never noticed that detail in the back of this panel until now, and I thought it was funny. Also, that is a throne made of human skin, which is pretty metal. Naturally, Dib is horrified by this future and tries to find a way to go back in time and prevent it. Unfortunately, he just gets captured and meets future Dib. Awesome! Can't wait to see them team up to beat the Zims. Actually, speaking of the Zims, our Zim is forced to wait six months, apparently, in future Zim's waiting room. This series makes use of ridiculous time cards from time to time, and while funny in their sheer absurdity, it does kind of make people with too much time on their hands such as me wonder how this is supposed to work. Now, of course, the actual explanation is, don't think about it, it's just a stupid joke. But a part of me thinks it would be funny if he wasn't actually sitting there for six months and that's just what it felt like, so it's just Zim being extra, like always. But then again, Zim has been shown to be surprisingly patient, even without factoring in these time card gags. Master, the tallest cut the transmission an hour ago. They did cut the transmission! So maybe he really was willing to sit here for six months. It certainly looks like Dib was waiting that long. Anyways, plot twist, future Zim is actually an asshole to current Zim and thinks he's an incompetent moron. The tallest actually approve of future Zim. He's taller and he has a goatee. But like, why? I hate this. Urkins don't grow hair. Is it fake? Please let it be fake. Actually, that would be a reasonable assumption to make, considering that his height is also a facade. He wears high heel boots. It's really funny that Zim would grow jealous of literally himself, enough to even free Dib to assist him in his defeat. But it's almost understandable, because future Zim truly does read like a completely different character. Like, he's just so chill. I honestly fail to comprehend how they could even be the same person, no matter how long it's been. Also, don't even get me started on how many paradoxes this issue creates. They even bring them up within the story and just tell you not to think about it. And for the sake of preserving my sanity, I'm inclined to listen. I know I've already hinted at this, but I really don't like Future Zim's design. The hat and the cloak are cool. It's neat how the cloak obscures his body for the sake of the high heel boot reveal near the end. Okay, fine, it's just the goatee. I hate it. Get rid of it. Is there no other way to make a character look older? Anyway, this one is neat. It's certainly better than the last one. Ultimately, I am a little bit biased against this one because I admittedly don't like the idea of Zim changing into a filthy prep like this, and even worse, GROWING A GOATEE! I don't know why I should even be invested enough in Zim of all characters to be dissatisfied with his future version. I don't know, I guess I always kind of identified with Zim being just fundamentally different from everyone else and being perpetually unable to be what his society demands of him. The idea of the better Zim just being successful by their standards and losing what made him Zim? It's lame! That's not Zim! Honestly, I side with past Zim here. Chuck that preparatory prick into the void. Hold it! But we're not done yet. We still have this cool little verse thing. At last, the frightful invaders had come, but not by the force of a zillion ray guns. They arrived rather quiet, and oh quite so sneaky, with precision and poise like a clock that's not squeaky. And just like that, evil crept into our homes, as each human being was replaced by a drone. 
So now as I walk these deathly still streets, not a jogger, nor a cop, nor a nun do I meet. And it takes all I have not to give up and scream, am I the only one to escape the vile scheme? But before I can crack, my fears all retract, and I'm spared an embarrassing spaz. For now I can see someone else besides me, and that someone is my sister, Gaz! Yet just as I run to the safety of kin, the hair on my neck starts to stand up again. With an unearthly howl that would shake the most glib, she crooks up her finger and bellows out, Dib. And with that it's apparent my cover is blown, as invaders pour forth from each shop, shed, and home. To flee is but folly as I'm gripped by the horde and I'm forced to submit to their cruel overlord. But my fears turn to rage at a fate truly grim when I realize my captor's grandmaster is Zim. I kick and I fight to his ego's delight, to my planet I vow to stay true. Embracing my demise, I look Zim in the eyes and I shout, I'll never join you! But grinning amused, Zim seeks to bemuse. He says, dib, 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 you've got it all wrong. And stoking my dread while patting my head, Zim laughs. You've been one of us all along. I like it. Zim is not my best friend. He's wonderful. No, he's the worst. You love Zim? No, I hate him. He's the most... I love Zim. There's something about the art in this next issue that puts me off a bit. I don't know, maybe it's the way they draw Zim's face sometimes. Oh, well, it's not that important. Zim is definitely at his most obnoxious in this one, and not in a funny way like in the last one. Here, I just kind of want to see him get curb stomped. Zim is one of those characters where he can be very unbearable when not portrayed correctly. And it's not because he's necessarily out of character, but just because they focus on the most annoying traits. In my opinion, Zim is it is most enjoyable when you're playing off of his insecurities and paranoia. Not only is it kind of relatable if you're a weirdo like me, but it also helps to view him and his goals as more sympathetic. Not necessarily that you want him to win, but you're not actively rooting against him above all else. That was initially one of the big gimmicks of this show. This idea that you don't really know who you're supposed to root for and just kind of be along for the ride. Dib in particular was a lot more malicious and scary early on in the show. In the rough drafts of the original Invader Zim pilot, he's even said to have used Gaz as a guinea pig for his experiments. But I'm not going to sit here and pretend that this change started with the comics. Even the show ended up pushing the dynamics so that Dib was more unanimously in the right. It never got to the point where it annoyed me though, fortunately. I really do prefer it when we emphasize Dib's unlikable traits, like his ego and contempt for the world around him and emphasize Zim's more sympathetic traits like his paranoia and desire to gain the respect of his leaders, so that the conflict of Zim trying to conquer the Earth and Dib trying to stop him seems less like a one-note hero versus villain thing. Not saying that Zim has to be some uwu widow soft boy that can't do anything wrong, that is far from the case. But he is our lead. He should be likable. A character can be likable without being a good person in any sense. What I'm getting at is I don't want him to be actively irritating to the audience. That is what this comic is. So some random aliens come to Earth trying to get Zim's new Humongo serum he has developed. And to coax it out of him, they kidnap Dib and threaten to do horrible things to him under the assumption that he and Dib are friends. Of course this assumption is wrong, so Zim doesn't care and actively enjoys watching the aliens torture Dib. But as it turns out, Dib had actually broken into Zim's lab earlier and taken the serum. Comically large sandwich. But upon being abducted, he impulsively swallowed the bottle to hide it. So while all this has been going on, Dib's stomach acid has come closer and closer to unleashing the monster within. When this is finally revealed, everyone gathers to try and get the serum out of Dib, but it's too late and he becomes monstrous. This would be the perfect time to get some serious payoff for all the Dib torture, but no? I mean, I guess he kind of chases Zim a bit? But at this point, I want to see Dib bash Zim's head in, you know? Even Bad Bad Rubber Piggy had a better payoff than this. At least we got to see Zim's brain get removed. I guess it's kind of funny that he considers grabbing Dib with his tractor beam, but then doesn't, because why would he? But at this point, I'm too frustrated to find much comedy in anything other than the floor of this space station getting a fresh coat of green paint. <laughs> anyway, this issue does have a few funny bits, mostly at the beginning, but overall, I didn't really like this one. And on top of that, it doesn't really feel like all that much happened. Wow, another one of these? Um, okay. 
this little mini story is about Zim stealing people's sweat. Yeah, seriously. I do find it funny just how manic and creepy Zim is about collecting the sweat. It's just a cursed premise with a cursed execution. I can appreciate some cursed content. I don't really care that Gerd drinks it in the end, but whatever, at least this one didn't annoy me. Oh boy, another Gaz-centric comic. We all remember how great the last one was. Now guys, I need you to take me at my word here. I am being 100% real. This portrayal of Gaz is my absolute favorite out of the entire franchise. Every episode of the show, every comic that has and will come, and even the movie. I only torment you because I know you can handle it. Uh, yeah, this comic is actually great. Not only is it nice to see a different side to Gaz that doesn't feel like a completely new character, but it's also really funny, too. Not only does the comic start with Zim falling in a ditch and breaking his legs, Zim getting injured is always iconic, but Dib is at his best in this issue, too. He's just the funniest little kid, dude. It's really cute to see him so excited to hunt the stupid Sasquatch variants, with Gaz having to vindicate him and play along. Why does she do this, you might be wondering? Well, if she doesn't, Dib will literally die. As it happens, that random chemical she gave Dib for hogging the TV for 12 hours straight will react with negative chemicals in the brain, causing Dib to explode when he becomes unhappy. When she finds out about this, she does feel bad and needs to keep him happy until the chemicals leave his body at the end of the day. This whole feeling-based exploding chemical is actually sort of reused from the cancelled episode Return of Keith. Hey! <laughs> You've just been splashed with my most diabolical creation ever! <laughs> it causes anyone who gets happy to blow up! <laughs> but I'm never that happy, especially when I'm covered in goo. You may have won the war, Dib, but you have not won the... 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 But, you know, they do the opposite this time, so they're actually a threat to someone like Dib. I like how Gaz ropes her online friends into helping her because she doesn't have in-person friends. Relatable. And also, I have no idea what happened to this guy, but him constantly crying for help and describing his torturous pain only to be ignored by everyone is just so on brand with my horrible sense of humor. Also, also, one of them just goes missing and it's never acknowledged, like, Jeff is dead. Dib is so stupidly optimistic and naive in this one that I'd say it borders on out of character, but I don't care, because him going ham squatch? Is the legend true? With wonder in his eyes as Gaz suppresses the urge to hurt him physically is just really funny. Another highlight is Gaz literally threatening Agent Batflaps in person to make him leave nice comments on Dib's videos. Like, that is hilarious. I really wish they brought back Batflaps after this. He was a really funny recurring character. This one is just stupid fun and it's a great read. One of my favorites so far. STOP SAYING NOPE! HOLD IT! Seriously? Another one? I like the art style for this one. It's neat. Especially the way the ghost looks. I mean, it's just rad. I like it. But seriously, three in a row? There was only one of these in the last video. You! You are being transferred to the underground classroom. And you! I'm just tired of you. Miss Bitters, are there really underground classes? Sure, whatever. This is the first and only time in the series we get a story focused on Miss Bitters. I mean, sure, she doesn't actually show up in person until the end, but whatever. Is that old kid? How's it going? Anyways, Miss Bitters is late for class, which leads the school children into speculating about her origins. It's neat how each story has a different art style, too. I must say it's neat that Dib is sort of the straight man in this one, calling out every story for being stupid and not making any sense. Which would be fair by itself, but I think Dib is wrong in saying that Miss Bitters is just a teacher and not worthy of any supernatural speculation at all. I mean, look at her, Dib, are you blind? My favorite story is probably Keeps, which is unfortunate because that means it peaks with the first one, but the other ones are decently enjoyable, too. These random non sequitur lines are getting a bit out of hand, though. Like, what does this even mean that something Gur would say? Overall, though, I do like this one. It's just a neat little change of pace. Zim's role is minimal because he's just kind of passed out for most of it, which is funny. 
Dib's whole thing of pointing out how stupid something is can get old, but in this one it's pretty justified. In a way, you kind of get why they hate Dib. He really does think he's too smart for the room. And of course, I have to talk about Gretchen. So glad they gave her a small spotlight here. She's my favorite school child character, and she just has an amazing design. Plus, I find her to be very funny. Um, hey! Escaped? They never would have made it past the minefield. That they're just gone. Hey, excuse me! What are you talking about? Some will suffer, yeah. But for the greater good. Why am I here? The proof I've been searching for. Why are you telling me this? Can I go now? I knew you'd be trouble. I really don't want to be here. She does this. She just keeps talking. I don't know why they gave her a new outfit, though. It just looks worse. Also, Poonchi Drinker of Hate is in this one. And his outfit is actually better. Although it's almost too good for a background character. The contrast makes him look like he's actually important. Sorry, this review is incredibly disjointed because it's not so much a developing plot to comment on as it is just a bunch of gags. And it works! I like this one. This art style! Well, it's certainly something new. As we've already seen and will continue to see, usually an upset in the art style makes it more cartoony and simplistic. As for this one, however, it's far more detailed. This series has always dabbled or straight up bathed in horror elements, so it's nice to see that in the forefront for this art style. Admittedly, I think the art style works better for the non-human characters. Gaz, and especially Dib, look very off to me. But Zim looks great! I love how his gloves and boots are like these cool protruding robotic cuffs. It's awesome! And his pack, I love the unique alien head-like shape they give it. The art style also complements just how much of an absolute cluster hole this story becomes by the end. I remember hating this one as a kid because I thought it was ugly. Good to know I've since grown a brain. It's very messy, but it's fitting. Anyway, the plot of this one is pretty simple. Dib scares Zim by wearing a clown mask. Wait, what year was this release? Reducing him to a squealing, sad, pathetic mess, and he's so embarrassed that he becomes completely manic trying to scare Dib back and secure his position as master of fear. This tally of their victories makes me feel so vindicated in my past observations. Seeing Zim's pathetic, misguided attempts to scare Dib is really funny, and Gaz even has a decent role in this one too, being the one that Zim keeps asking for advice on how to scare Dib. It's neat to get some more Zim and Gaz interaction. Even though his attempts are pathetic, Dib does start to get worried and gets an implant from his father that will suck the fear out of his brain and store it in this disgusting juice sack on the back of his head, in essence making him unscarable. I find it weirdly endearing that Zim is scared to go into this allegedly haunted house after this kid gives the actual worst scary story I've ever heard. This reads like it's straight off of TikTok. Weird to think that this Zim is more likable than this Zim. It's a good example of that thing I was talking about earlier where playing off of Zim's insecurities makes him more fun to watch. He is so scared of the idea of anyone thinking he could even be scared or see any of his vulnerabilities or weaknesses at all, and his utter inability to own up to it only serves to make him look less secure. Like, this is the most unhinged issue yet. Zim straight up dumps an entire graveyard on Dib, you can see the corpses, and kidnaps some famous horror author, shortly before sending him off into space when he wasn't able to scare Dib in like 30 seconds. Zim is really at the end of his rope in this one. He even cries in rage when Dib is acting all proud for having scared him. This issue was weird, but I kind of really liked it. Well, I guess we're back to the standard art style. Say goodbye to Zim's cool robot cuffs and hello to... Zim. Girly Ranger Scout outfit Zim. Well, at least it's purple. It's purple! Thought you'd like it. You know, I'm still in prison and I was wondering... The 83 Girly Ranger codes of conduct just make me think of the 57 precepts of Zote. So Zim and Dib have been captured by an alien named Dolores, and she agrees to let one of them go if they can convince her that they deserve it more than the other. So in other words, we have another anthology on our hands, as Dib and Zim swap stories of their heroism that grow increasingly more stupid and desperate as we go. A premise like this easily could have been really stupid and cringy, but I actually think that this is the funniest comic we've gotten yet. It's just full of non-stop funny and witty character interactions. 
There are even panels where they just awkwardly shove in tons of dialogue, but I don't even care because I just think it's really funny. Weirdly, the stories themselves are probably the worst part. The singular joke is pretty much just, they're stupid and obviously fake. But even then, the stupid ways in which they are fake just speak to their characters perfectly and manage to humor me anyway. The highlight of this comic is probably just the prison banter between Zim and Dib. It's just really good. I don't know how much longer I can just say that I think this issue is really funny because that's really all there is to it. The plot is incredibly basic. It does take a turn, however, when Dolores reveals that she was never actually planning on letting either of them go. And she's actually a producer using their stories to create a TV show. Only for them to get released anyway because everyone hates their show and it gets cancelled. I'm sure I don't even need to say anything more on that point. Anyway, this one's great. Oh wow, another one. So, uh, yeah. Zim creates a device that destroys Urkin tech to use on Tack's ship while Dib's asleep. But it's triggered by him yelling, which would wake Dib up, I would think. But anyways, Zim has to wait for nightfall without yelling anything. He fails. Who could have seen that coming? It's fine, I guess. If anything, I would have liked to see Zim get tortured a little bit longer before getting his base destroyed, but whatever. I think this base premise actually could have worked for a whole issue, but as it is, it's too short to really be anything all too interesting. The coming invasion will not be stopped by your burritos! I wasn't expecting an M. Night Shyamalan last airbender whitewashing joke in Invader Zim, but go off, I guess. This one is actually good too! We are on a hot streak here, guys. Like, it has just been banger after banger. Anyway, we get to see Invader Larb in this one. He's an invader on the taller side that's been used to showcase how taller Urkins get preferential treatment. And that's no different here. Zim gets jealous of him because of all of his titles, most of which required little to no effort to receive. An interesting one here mentioned is Conqueror of Blorch. Like, back in episode 1 of the show, Blorch, home of the slaughtering rat people, was going to be assigned to Larb. But when his increased height was taken into the equation, he was given Vort, home of the universe's most comfortable couch, instead. The task of conquering Blorch was instead assigned to Invader Scooge, because they think he's short and ugly. In Battle of the Planets, however, the Urkin Armada is celebrating the first planet to be conquered for Operation Impending Doom 2. The conquered planet? Blorch. The invader responsible? The invader! Scooge? Greetings, my tallest! As the invader responsible for this planet's downfall, I get to launch a traditional final cannon sweep, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, there's a new tradition now. Man, you're ugly! And short. They end up giving the audience a slightly different version of the ceremony, and giving both Scooge's name and achievements to some random tall Urkin in the crowd instead. Noticeably, not Larb. Much like the whole text ship debacle I brought up in the last video, while this is a retcon, I actually prefer this change. Not only is Larb's whole role basically to showcase bias amongst Urkin society, but he was originally supposed to be assigned to Blorch, so the tallest attributing the victory to him instead makes more sense. That being said, I do wish that Lar was actually taller. If he were noticeably taller than the other invaders, that would make the preferential treatment make more sense. Anyway, it really is a shame that we don't ever get to see Scooge in the comic series from what I recall. He was one of my favorite minor characters and was planned to have a bigger role in the show before it was canceled. But there's actually a moment in a future issue to prompt further discussion on this matter, so I'll leave it at that for now. Anyway, now to talk about the actual comic. So Zim is jealous of the positive attention that Larb receives for his worthless achievements. So Zim decides to, in his words, pad his invader's score and get an easy title to get the tallest to acknowledge him. He decides to take over a restaurant called Burrito King, so he can be the Burrito King. It is just as dumb as it sounds. He overthrows this humble chef guy named Burrito Royale, who later has an epic anime comeback after learning bean bending, and defeats Zim with a trap that was literally just always there for no reason. I like how he didn't even use the bean bending to defeat Zim, he just already had a trap there that he just uses. I also think it's funny that Zim will just casually hack into the tallest feed. It does make you wonder how aware he is of how much they hate him. I don't really care for the Gur stuff in this one, unfortunately. It's just Gur being Gur and it takes up quite a bit of time. It's not terrible, but it's really nothing all that entertaining. The way that Zim interacts with his burrito subjects makes me think of an observation I made back in issue 3, where Zim never actually knows how to act when he actually is in power, and it's just incredibly awkward. This is why future Zim is a total fraud, by the way. So glad that loser is riding in the void. Ryan is alive?! 
Anyway, this one is pretty solid. I enjoyed it. As funny as I think this one is, the Gur content does nothing for me and brings it down a bit, unfortunately. Interesting premise we got for this one. The Robo Parents are finally prominently featured in an issue. I don't think I've even mentioned them so far, and for good reason, they're kinda just there. But this one is still decent. There's an event at school where the parents of the children are supposed to talk about their jobs. Zim wasn't planning on participating, but the Robo Parents show up anyway and claim to be zookeepers. Dip decides to take advantage of this and take the whole class to see it to try and expose Zim as a fraud once and for all. So Zim has to use his bio oven to create one on the fly, relying on Gur to tell him about Earth animals. As you'd expect, Gur's ideas of what animals are turns out to be just... absolutely cursed and horrific. These abominations are quite humorous to me, especially the Gorgas and the Jeff. Much to Zim's surprise, his zoo isn't as convincing as he thought it was, and law enforcement ends up getting involved. I enjoyed the character of Emola Chrome of the Zoo Crimes Division. She delivers some pretty great material. Also, it's neat to get to see some of the kid's parents, especially Gretchen's dad. Like, I just love that he looks like this. I couldn't even tell you why. I love most of this issue, but the part where Zim goes to steal real animals before the law enforcement returns is pointless and not really all that great. The joke of him just not liking the way they smell and dumping them off in someone's pool is really lame. So, even though he was terrified of the consequences of being labeled a grifter, Zim changes basically nothing by the time they get back. It is funny how she just arrests the robo-parents and Dib is reprimanded for demanding that a child be punished for the actions of their parents. Overall, though, this one is still pretty good and definitely one of the funnier issues so far. Don't rate my llama and I have fresh parents in the cellar. I love the things they say in Invader Zim. I'm not sure what the social commentary was for this, though. I mean, I get it. The common person is oblivious to impending danger and looks the other way to entertainment rather than the telltale signs of evil doings. But what's with the whole zoo theme this time? What's the writer's point? Maybe on second thought, this is about people caring more about pets than people and lives lost. Bigger evils are allowed to pass, but as soon as animal is hurt, oh hell nah, I gotta lock someone up. It's a Zim Zoo, don't overthink it. Fine, you watch TV. I'll save the world. The Big 2-0, and this one is actually written by Jonan Vasquez, the creator of the series, which is neat. Your thoughts on Zim and Dib romance? Security? <laughs> right off the bat, I just have to say this issue is absolutely gorgeous. The colors are like vibrant milk and honey to my eyes, and the art is very clean and expressive. In a lot of previous issues, the art can look a bit sloppy and haphazard in places, but here it's consistently clean and uh, consistent. Granted, most of this issue just takes place with Zim on the couch, but hey, at least it's a nice couch to look at. Oh yeah, speaking of, the plot. Zim sits on his ass for presumably over two years straight, binge-watching a cartoon. Yeah, yeah, for real. Gur actually watches this show in the movie. By the end of this one, the raccoons that broke into their house to feast on their snack garbage have died and rotted away. And we see Zim pry himself out of the pile of crust and filth. Pretty sure his flesh is partially fused to it too. Nah, I'm just kidding. That's not the end, because now they have to watch the second show. While all this exhilarating action is going on, Zim's latest creation actually succeeds at conquering the Earth. But Zim takes so long watching television that the conquering blob rethinks his view on humanity, reconstructs society, and goes into space in search of more societies to help. So in a way, Zim being so idolatrous and lazy was technically the best thing that ever happened to human civilization, and likely various other civilizations. He's a true hero. Hearing Zim criticize the writing of this show he's been watching for months on end is really funny. Dude really thinks he's some sort of critic. Issue 20? More like issue 2020, am I right, guys? Zim playing Kiss, Mary Kill and getting the option between floopsy schmoopsy and the hot dog roaming the house because the mold has become sentient is a comedic highlight for me. Ultimately, this one kind of being an anti-plot holds it back from being a contender for the best, but for what it is, it is really funny. We got a new art style again. It's certainly, uh, interesting. I don't really have any problems other than Zim's antenna being green. This enrages me. So 
So some typical sci-fi mishaps take place and our cast of four switch bodies. Zim switches with Gaz and Gurr switches with Dib. They also become these weird fusions where they still like have their eyes and some other traits and stuff. Gaz still has a little tuft of her hair, for example. There are also some changes that make absolutely no sense, such as Gaz's shirt now having the Invader logo. Logical or not, that's a really cool detail. The machinations of this are really confusing and even intriguing. Because he's in Gaz's body, Zim feels an uncontrollable urge to play video games. Game over. Cheating pig! Because he's in Gur's body, Dib is experiencing frequent hallucinations and is going insane. Gur? Well, he's just kind of the same. But Gaz? Gaz is where it gets interesting. She's acting completely and utterly different and wants to conquer the Earth herself. She even starts a bet with the real Zim that she can do it in three days. The winner of the bet gets the planet, and the loser of the bet gets banished to the moon. Well. Dib says that Gaz is acting more Urken than human, but that isn't really the case. She's too competent to be Urken. She destroys all of the world's weapons under the guise of creating world peace. She ends world hunger with a product that slowly erodes the free will of the consumer. Her plan is genius and very subtly implemented too. Like only upon this reread did I make the connection between the Borlax Nectar cereal Gaz ends world hunger with and the Nectar Zim mentions at the beginning of the comic. Like, oh, that's why everyone's brainwashed at the end. It's really tightly done, but can be pretty confusing if you're not paying a lot of attention to the details. But if you do pay attention to the details, other things start to fall apart. Like when Gaz reveals that she plans to take over the Earth for real. Why is Zim surprised? This was literally the conditions of their bet, that the winner would get the planet. I guess she did say that everyone would know the name Zim, but she literally started going by Zim like two days ago. Is this really such a zinger? Dib's confusion is a bit more understandable since Gaz did tell him she was doing this to shut down Zim's operation. But it's clear that Dib was suspicious from the get-go. I mean, the whole reason he even came here was to stop her. D -d -d did he just forget that? This whole issue is just really confusing. And while it certainly does get you thinking, it doesn't really make me feel anything but confusion. And this series is supposed to be a comedy. I've really thought about this one, and I still feel like it's going over my head in some areas. It's weird. One thing I do appreciate, though, is that a comparison can be drawn between her obsession with video games and how she behaves when she's in Zim's body. It's like her new autistic hyperfixation is World Conquest, so now she's much more deadly than when her ambitions were just to be left alone to play games. Except that she still plays video games? Man, this one confuses me. I feel conflicted on this one because I don't want to hate it. It has some really interesting ideas and I do like the ending, but ultimately this one is just too odd and not funny at all, really. I am so hopelessly scrambled. Maybe it's fitting. Let's finish this batch off. Serious work we do. Ooh. Cows are my friends. I don't like you. Well, this is a neat issue to end the video off on. It's part one of a four part story arc. From what I recall, there's only one other four part story in this series, and we'll get to that one later. Luckily, each part of the story arc is pretty self contained, so I should be able to talk about this one here and save the rest for next time. I know it's a bit anticlimactic to end off a video with an issue that's pretty much just set up for the next one, but guys, I have to keep the numbering scheme consistent. Anyway, Zim is trying one of his typical schemes, involving infecting the atmosphere with Cheeto dust, which was literally his plan from issue 12 at the beginning of this video. It's poetic, really, I think. Anyway, Gert continues to sabotage his plan by going into this weird killing state. It is pretty neat watching Zim trying to keep his scheme together as Gert's literally trying to kill him. And this one is pretty funny overall too. It also has some high energy action. There's this little narrative they kind of try to push about Zim not being nice enough to Gerb, but ultimately it doesn't really matter since Gerb's behavior problem is caused by a virus and not anything actually personal. And is Zim really that mean to Gerb? I mean, he did get Gerb the Cheeto hat he wanted. And consider what Gerb puts him through. All right! A lot of these moments read like they're supposed to be set up for something or whatever, but spoilers, this arc stops being about Gur at all by the halfway point, so it's all just kind of pointless. Overall, this one is just fine. It's got some good bits, but leaves us off on a much more interesting note, where Zim is going to have to go inside of Gur's head to find out what this protocol Veruz Omega is. I, for one, cannot wait to find out, is what I would say if I hadn't read all of these years ago.
And with that, we're done with another part. Ultimately, I think the comics are really starting to find their footing. Sure, not all of them were bangers, but there were a lot of really great ones in this batch. And with our upcoming four-part story arc, it would seem that things are looking up. Thank you for wasting your valuable lives on my content, and even though I won't be seeing you, I certainly hope that you continue to waste your valuable lives and continue to hear me next time.